How's everybody doing this morning? How many of you are thankful for Jesus? Amen? Man, what an incredible morning of worship it's been so far. Uh, I just got to say this this morning. We are incredibly blessed to have such a wonderful team of worship leaders. Amen? Uh, every single one of them that come and just the, just the, the uh, man, just the, the broad array, I don't know how else to say it, of just worship leaders that we have and those who are gifted in such a unique way, it's, uh, I, I wish I could sing. Any of you ever find yourself saying that? You know, I wish I could sing. You know, I, I hear that it's okay to make joyful noise to the Lord, and that's exactly what I do, you know. No more, no less, I can promise you. Yeah, you don't want me up there. The, the first Sunday that Ryan was here, uh, I told him, I said, man, I, I'd love to sing with y'all. He said, if you would stand right over there in the dark, you know. Away from all the mics, you know. He hadn't even heard me yet. So anyway, I don't know. But uh, speaking of Ryan, it's great to have him here. In case you weren't here last week, we have a new worship pastor. Amen? Amen. And he and his wife, Carly, and their family, they're in the middle of uh, just sort of transitioning uh, from Oviedo, Florida to uh, Valdosta. And just be praying for them as they make those those plans and as they continue that transition, looking for home to to buy and that sort of thing and and so they're in that process now and just so excited for that this morning we're going to finish up our series that we are currently in called blind spots right and uh and, and this is a series where we've been walking through john chapter 9 john chapter 9 we're going to just continue to do that this morning and uh what an incredible uh just chapter of scripture that we've been looking at it has so much to teach us really about one subject and that is blindness spiritual blindness that's why the series is called blind spots and so i want to pray for us and we're going to dive into the word here this morning uh we 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 have the privilege this morning of really studying together this morning and really the the grand finale of this chapter the crescendo if you will of this chapter and so very excited about diving into this with you this morning so let's pray father we're grateful lord for your presence in our life in this place in our hearts god in the hearts of new believers. And God, we just thank you for the work that you're doing here. God, just how you move in our lives as individuals, but also, Father, as a faith family. God, it's just so, it's so obvious, God, the, the work that you're doing in this place. And God, I just pray that as we, as we think about uh, all that you are and all that you're doing, God, that we would be compelled as your disciples to... To go there for and make disciples of all nations. Father, that we would recognize the calling that's been placed on our life to be your witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Father, we love you so much. We pray that as we dive into this passage today that you will teach us something and help us to apply it to our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in 1982... I was 19 years old. My mom walked in and she said, David, I think we need to get you a more reliable car. I said, yes. She said, I've been talking to a dealership downtown. My ears perked up as a 19-year-old. I'm excited. I want to hear more about this. What's, what's going on? I, she said, I've, I, I've talked to a man down there. He's got a real sporty car that I want to take you down there and show you. And, man, my heart just leapt for joy. I was, the car I was driving, I mean, you had to crank it with a pair of pliers. I mean, I was popping the hood. I mean, it was not a very reliable vehicle, and, 
of all the work and school and everything I was involved in, she said, we need to get you something. And she says, it's a new car. And, man, I got real excited then. And so we rode down to the dealership, and I couldn't wait. I'm thinking, Camaro, Firebird, what could it be that is so sporty that she's going to buy me? Surely not a Corvette, but I'll settle for a Camaro. And so we got there, and the dealer walked us out to a 1982 Subaru Hatchback GT Sport. The only thing that made it sport was one pinstripe that went down the side and the word sport at the end. There was nothing else about this car. And as a 19-year-old kid, I looked at this car and I thought, what in the world? Ultimately, I was blessed to have it, I guess. You might say it didn't break down. It's pretty reliable, right? That's what I had. But here's the crazy thing about this car is that in one year, I ended up wrecking it twice. The first time, I was driving down the road in town, and as I was driving down the road, I I saw some friends off on the side of the road hanging out in the front yard, and as I drove by, I'm checking out what they're doing. I'm looking into everything that's going on, and I'm waving at them. Hey, guys, what's going on? And it's one of those things where you're driving, and you just let your your face just turn with the friends, and I'm all but hanging out the window. And what I didn't recognize was the reality of what was in front of me, which was a car that had stopped to turn left, and he was waiting on traffic, and I just plowed right into the back of that car. Knocked me out. When I woke up, all my friends were over there trying to pull me out of the car, along with the guy that I hit. Are you okay, they said. Just tore the car up. It was less than a few months old. I got it fixed. I was back on the road, right? And a few months later, my sister and I were driving uh, over to see my dad, and we were on a country road, and we were going, and we weren't speeding. I mean, you couldn't speed in this thing. It had 72 horsepower, okay? The engine was measured by cc's, okay? Not cubic inches, cubic centimeters, right? It wouldn't go very fast, but... As we were driving along, I became distracted by these little creatures called gnats. Have you ever been, you know, they get in the car in the summer, and and then as you turn the air on, they tend to to sort of migrate toward the windows. You ever notice this? And, And as I was driving along, I realized that there were about 400 on my window. It was kind of freaking me out, and so I'd let my window down. Yeah, it was roll windows, you know, and I was, I was shooing them out, and again, I didn't recognize the reality of what was in front of me, which was a very sharp curve. Now, this time was not just a little fender bender. This time, we rolled it three times, and that was the end of the Subaru. They're, they're made of tinfoil, so it, did, it didn't last. I don't even know, by the grace of God, we survived, right? So it was over. But the reality is this, and this is what I wanted to share with you today, is that both of these examples of these wrecks, they're both examples of, a, of, a, of the reality of not seeing what lies in front of you. The reality, the truth. What's exactly in front of you, and, and you don't see it, you're... You're blind to this, to this problem that lies ahead if you don't alter your direction, right? Well, this morning we're going to be looking at John chapter 9, finishing this series up here. And we're talking, uh, what we've seen in this, in this chapter is really two kinds of blindnesses. We've seen physical blindness and we've also seen spiritual blindness the story starts out where Jesus is 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 engaging with a man who the scriptures say has been blind since birth Uh, he's a blind man he's physically blind he can't see the world around him and Jesus as you know because we've studied through it he comes and he he heals this man physically and so we see this this physical blindness uh, but we also begin to see very clearly and quickly that that this is a story more than just simply about physical blindness and Jesus' ability to heal us. We begin to see that this is about spiritual blindness as well. And this morning we have this, this crescendo, if you will, this grand finale of the story that we've been walking through over the last four weeks. And as we dive into this text we begin to see something that is interesting. This morning I want to talk about the difference between spiritual sight and spiritual blindness. 
Okay, so we've talked a little bit over the series about spiritual blindness and what that means, but, but we begin to see the difference between being able to see things spiritually, but also being able to recognize the spiritual blindness in our life. And so read with me, if you will, John chapter 9, verse 35 through 41. This is what the word says. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out. And when he found him, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him, he asked. And Jesus answered, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. I believe, Lord, he said. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see and those who do see will become blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and asked him, we aren't blind too, are we? And Jesus said, he says, if you were blind, Jesus told them, you you wouldn't have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. So this passage is is the conclusion of John chapter 9. And it confirms something that I mentioned to you at the very onset of this series. If you remember, if you were here for the first message, I said... This is a, is a message about physical blindness being healed, that Jesus' ability to physically heal people, right? But there's a greater story to be told here that this is a story also about spiritual blindness. And that wasn't evident in the first sermon, but it became more evident as we continued to read through it and study it together. And as we get to this one, we begin to see that this is exactly what uh, Jesus was doing in the midst of all that was going on here. And so I want to show you the difference between spiritual sight, which is really carried out in, in this passage in verses 35 through 39, and spiritual blindness, which is verses 40 through 41. Now the term blind or blindness in Scripture is often used, it's a, it's a metaphor that's used to talk about man's inability to comprehend truth. We see this all through Scripture where Jesus is confronting people with truth. We see where Jesus comes to people and he teaches truth. And as he's teaching this truth, there are those who maybe they just flat out reject it from the beginning. They see Jesus as nothing but a lunatic. They don't want anything to do with him. Or maybe they, they ponder everything that Jesus has to say. And as they listen to him, as they think about the words that he says, they just don't get it. But this word blindness, it's, it's something from the Old Testament to the, to the New that is used to talk about not being able to comprehend truth when it's standing right in front of you. Isaiah once said this, he said, the people are blind even though they have eyes. And so it's, it's very obvious that, you know, he's talking about spiritual blindness. He says they have, the, they have physical eyes, but they can't see. Jeremiah said something very similar. He says, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And he's talking about here when he says this. He says, they don't have the spiritual eyes to see the truth. And, and, and as Jeremiah puts it, they don't even have the ears to hear. You know, they don't have the spiritual ears to hear the truth. And so this is often used in Scripture. I love where Paul testified that Jesus had commissioned him to go to the people and to preach the truth, we see this in Acts 26, and he says, he says that Jesus told him, he says, I am sending you to them, look at this, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so here's what Paul says. He says, Jesus, he commissioned me. 
he's talking to King Agrippa, and he says, he, he says, Jesus, uh, he commissioned me to go out and to share the gospel with who? With, he says, my people, the Jews, but also the Gentiles. And as I go, I'm called to go and, and, and deliver them the truth that will open their eyes, that they may see that forgiveness is found in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful thing this is to, to think about. I love this testimony that Paul gives. But spiritual blindness could be summed up like this, not being able to comprehend that Jesus wants to do something remarkable in your life. Every one of us here this morning, if you are a believer, if you're a disciple of Jesus, if I were to ask you this morning, you know, has Jesus done something remarkable in your life? Has he transformed your heart? Has he saved you from your sin? Has he brought you out of darkness into light? Has he set you on a path of sanctification? You would testify, wouldn't you? You would testify, absolutely that's what Christ has done because that's what Jesus does, amen? That's what he does. And so this morning, we, we want to see these differences between being able to have that spiritual sight compared to that spiritual blindness. Now, I don't want to talk about spiritual blindness anymore because what I want to do is I want to jump into the spiritual sight, which is really the onset, the beginning of this whole text that we see here. And this is where I want to spend most of our, uh, our time as we continue to dive into this. Uh, this morning, I want us to look at this spiritual light and how, excuse me, spiritual sight and how spiritual sight, listen to this, leads to salvation, right? It leads to salvation. It's when those eyes are opened up. You know, one of the things that we know about the Apostle Paul is that when he was, he was persecuting Jesus, he had placed over his eyes these things that were like scales and he could not see. He couldn't see physically either, right? He couldn't see spiritually. He couldn't understand it. He didn't comprehend it. He was wanting to destroy what is known as the way or what was known as the way, the Christian faith. He was wanting to do away with it. But Jesus came into his life, right? He met him on that road to Damascus. Then those scales were removed, and not only could he again physically see, but he could now spiritually see that Jesus was the one that he was to follow. And so I want to talk about how we need to understand that that spiritual sight, it leads to salvation. Now here's what our passage, and this is where we're going to zero in on. This is what we're going to be talking about here this morning. The first thing that we need to understand that our passage teaches us, very important, salvation requires divine intervention. Salvation, it requires divine intervention. In other words, God's got to be the first, right? God's got to be at work. God's got to be moving. You see, after healing the blind man here in this text, as we look at this, Jesus disappears from the scene. Have you noticed that? He's no longer in the narrative. Jesus comes. He wipes the mud on the man's eyes. He washes his face. He can physically see. And then suddenly Jesus is out of the narrative. We don't see Jesus anymore, do we? Not for a while. What we see is we see the neighbors who come to this man and they go, hey, how can you now see? What's going on in your life? He said, this man named Jesus. He doesn't really know that much about Jesus. He just goes and gives testimony to Jesus. We don't see Jesus anymore. We just see this encounter between the neighbors and, and the man who had been blind since birth. And then after that, what do we see? We see that they're, they're, this man is brought to the Pharisees. So now the Pharisees are part of the narrative. They're part of this story that we're reading. And the narratives, I mean, the, the Pharisees, begin to question him they begin to ask him you know how is it that you can see you didn't used to could see but now you can see how is it and he has this guy named Jesus he points to Jesus again but again Jesus is not standing there he's nowhere around and so then they call in the parents the parents become part of the story we have that they give testimony that this was indeed their son but they say I don't know anything about how he got healed you'll have to talk to him right so in comes the man again. They bring him back again. I mean, do you see this, uh, this thing that is happening, this man? The whole world questions this man's sight. This whole world questions how he was once blind, but now he can see. But Jesus is not part of the story. And then we see something really incredible. We see this community of people who supposedly love God, remove him from their community. They excommunicate him. They say, you know what? 
If all you're going to do is point to Jesus, you're out of here. Get out. Get out. Stay out. We don't want you to be a part of our community anymore. You're no longer welcome here. And so now what we see is the blind man who is on his own. But Jesus. Amen? How many of you does that describe your story in your life? You know, all this is going on in our life. You know, you're confused. Your you, life is different. You, you don't understand it. You're being questioned by people. Maybe you're starting to change, you know, drift into a sort of a different style, lifestyle and move away from who you used to be. You don't understand it really, but Jesus comes into your life and everything changes you know what I love about this text here that we just read? Is that's how it begins. Look at this with me, if you will. In verse 35, the passage, it starts off like this. But Jesus heard that they had cast him out. I want you to know, notice something here. The man did not go looking for Jesus. Jesus went looking for him. Jesus went looking for him. It says Jesus had heard that they had excommunicated, that they had removed him from their presence, kicked him out of the community. Now this guy is feeling, uh, instead of joy over the sight that he now has, suddenly he's dealing with loneliness from being on his own. And Jesus comes looking for him, rejected by his neighbors, rejected by the religious leader, uh, leaders of his day, but sought after by the Redeemer. Sought after by the Redeemer. How many of you are thankful that Jesus came looking for you? Amen? That Jesus came looking for you. You see, here's what we need to understand. The depth of what this text is teaching us is this, that according to Scripture, no one would be saved if God didn't take the first step. No one would be saved if God didn't take the first step. That's what Scripture teaches us. Listen to this. Romans 3, 10 through 12, it says this. No one is righteous, not one. You know what Scripture is telling us here? It's saying that outside of Christ Jesus, there's not a single good person that exists on this earth. Never has been, never will be. No one is righteous outside of Christ Jesus. No one, not one. It continues here. It says, no one understands. We're talking about spiritual blindness, right? This is important. No one understands the truth of Christ. Not outside of Christ. Not outside of God doing a work. No one understands. No one's righteous. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? That's what the Scripture tells us. The wages of sin is death eternally separating us from God we're not we're just wretched sinners that's all we are we don't have the ability to understand not one of us all have turned aside together they have became worthless no one does good not even one remember John 6 when we were back in John 6 verse 44 Jesus says this no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day No one can even approach the throne of God without Jesus. Jesus has to take the first step. Jesus told his disciples this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. This is why I love Jesus so much. I don't know why you love him so much, or if you love him so much. I hope you love him so much, especially if you're a believer. But this is why I love Jesus. You see, I grew up in a broken home. My parents were divorced. I, I, I was sort of, you know, shuffled from one parent to the other. Now, I had wonderful parents. They loved me. There's no doubt about that. But there was a lot of confusion in my life. And as I, as I sought just validation, as I sought friendships, as I sought the things that I felt like would maybe make me feel good about life, it was not in the things of God. It was in other things. And I, I was pursuing the things of the world. And, 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 I, and I found zero satisfaction in any of that. And yet, Jesus came into my life. He began to stir in my heart. He began to woo me with the the Spirit of God drawing me 
closer and closer to God, I begin to do things that are outside of my own nature. Things like stop in a, in a small town and because I saw a, a, a store that said Christian Bookstore. And, and it just it kind of got my attention. And I walked in there and I said, is this where you buy the Bible? And they said, yeah, what one do you want? I said, the holy one? I don't know. <laughs> They're referring to translations. I don't even know anything about Jesus. I don't even know why I'm stopping to buy a Bible. Things like that were taking place in my life, and I wasn't pursuing Jesus. Jesus was pursuing me. That's why I love Jesus, because here's the reality. I know I'm not worthy. That's why we hear things like in the Scripture where it says we're saved by grace. You know that? You don't deserve it. You just got it. Right? You don't deserve salvation. I know what I deserve. <laughs> you know what you deserve. You may think you deserve more than you deserve, but you don't. Right? Amen? Amen. We know what we deserve, but grace says you're going to receive that which you don't deserve. Mercy says God's going to hold back what we do deserve. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. But God. But God. And we need to understand that. We need to understand what is happening here as we look at this text. We need to understand what this entire chapter of Scripture has been about. It's not about a man whose sight was given as a free gift, a physical gift of healing. It's not about that. I'm sure he was very thankful for that. And even his disciples, if you remember, they said this. They said, why is this that this guy was born blind? And Jesus said, because God wants to do something in his life. That's the first indication, right? Saying, and, you know, the guy could have said, well, he did. But his soul would have still been going to hell. You see, Jesus wasn't finished. He didn't stop with the physical healing of his eyes. There was something else that needed to take place. I love this. I love that this talks about how awesome our Jesus is. Listen to how, how Paul explained it when he was writing to the Ephesians. He said this, and you were dead. He was talking to these, the, these churchgoers. He's talking to the church in Ephesus. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit now working in the di disobedience, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were, but God. You see that? Just underline that in your Bible. If you're taking notes, just write in all caps, but God. Take that home with you. Stick it in your pocket this morning. Amen. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. We see those two words, don't we? Mercy. God looked on your life, he smiled upon your life, he held back the wrath that you deserved, and instead he gave you what you don't deserve, which is salvation in Christ Jesus. He made you alive in Jesus. Amen? That's what he did for us, guys. I hope you understand that. Not only does salvation require divine intervention but here's the second part of it all salvation responds in faith you know here's what the scriptures tell us we are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus so here's here comes your part right God's done his part he's drawn you into himself he's transformed your heart but you still have a responsibility in this. Not that you can save yourself. You can't do that. That's on God. But you have a responsibility in responding to this faith. And what we see is that salvation brings about this response in faith. And we see it right here in this passage. Look at verse 35. Jesus said that. 
they had ca- they, he had heard that. They had cast him out. And having found him, he went looking for him. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, this is the blind man. He says, and he, who, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Now look at what Jesus says, verse 37. Jesus says to him, you have seen him, and he is speaking to you. I love this. Isn't Jesus so creative like this sometimes? It's like, you know, it's the woman at the well. Remember that story? He's looking at Jesus. I mean, Jesus is standing in front of her. And she says, well, who is the Messiah? He says, (laughs) I'm that guy. (laughs) You know, in the most humble ways, you know, Jesus, who could just be in all his glory, you know, he just says, well, I'm, I'm I'm that guy. I'm the one. I'm the one you've been waiting on. I'm here now. And just like the Samaritan woman, she runs into town. Come and see, I found the Messiah. Right? Standing before the blind man, who could now see with his own eyes? He didn't need just ears to hear. He had eyes to see. He's looking physically at Jesus. And Jesus says to him, but here's the thing. A lot of people had physically seen Jesus. A lot of Pharisees had physically seen Jesus. And they didn't respond. And God's done this mighty work in this man's life. He's standing right here and he says, I'm that guy. Now look, here it comes. Here's here's the part. Here's Here's the salvation responding in faith. Look at verse 38. He says, Lord, what do these next words say? I believe. I believe. That's not even the best part. And he responded in worship. worship you know we celebrate uh, a new worship pastor and I'm so thankful I'm glad that task is over Ryan glad to have you Carly thank you for allowing him to be our pastor I know you were the one that really made the decision for your your family but anyway thank you guys for being here Here, here's the thing but I, I want you to know and I know he would want you to know as well you know worship is not just it's not just singing it's not reciting these words that are on the screen just because everybody else around here. It, it's, it, it's, it's pouring your heart out to a holy and righteous God that before you ever walked in here, you're saying to yourself, but God, but God, it's not about him. It's not about the other worship leaders. It's not about the pastor. It's not about your friends that have gathered here with you. It's not about your family. It's about you and God worshiping each other and what we see here is that the salvation that this man experienced it responded in faith it believed in its heart he believed deep down that Jesus was the one in whom he had declared himself to be just like he did in your life when he saved you amen so we come in here not for Ryan not for David not for any of the other pastors, not for any of our friends or family. We come in here for Jesus. We come in here for Jesus. Thank you, Angela, for loving God enough to give him praise. The rest of you, I pray for your soul. I pray for your soul. Angela, boy, she's the spiritual leader of the congregation. I love her so much. Woo! So we see this unfolding We've got to understand the, the, the reality uh, that faith is such, an, uh, is such a significant part, a foundational part of who we are as God's children. This man believed. What does it mean to believe? Here's what I want, to, I want to share with you this morning, that simply believing that God exists, that He's some sort of cosmic force, that's not the evidence of salvation. And here's why I would say that. Did you realize even the, even the devil believes in Jesus? So there's obviously something different about this guy than the devil, right? Listen to what James says. James says, you believe in God, that you believe that God is one, good, but even the demons believe and they shudder. 
In other words, the demons, the devil, they're very aware of who Jesus is, maybe more aware of who Jesus is than me and you are because they shudder at the thought of who God is. They fear God. They, they, they hold God in reverence because they know who Jesus is. This is the enemy we're talking about. What about God's children? How do they view? How do they believe in Jesus? What is it that they believe about Jesus? We begin to see this as we go throughout the Scripture. We begin to understand, and there's so many more, but I want to give you two consistent components, two consistent components to real biblical faith. First one, biblical faith is the kind of faith that trusts in God. It's the kind of faith that says, I trust in you, Lord. I will follow you, Lord. I believe in you, but I believe enough to say, God, I trust you with my life. My life is meaningless without you. My life is desperate without you. I trust in you. Isn't it funny how in our culture today, in our world today, these two words cause us to pause? Hey, man, just trust me. (laughs) You ever heard of car salesman? I know we got a few of those in here. I'm like, I don't trust you, not an inch, right? You insurance salesman, you real, I mean, you know, salesman in general, you're all of the, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We hear this all the time, though, don't we? We hear it from our friends. You got to trust me. Come on, go with me over here. You got to trust me. You're going to have the time of your life. And too often we realize that those two words fail us, don't they? Those two words, trust me, what does that mean in our world today? It means nothing. Hopefully it means something, but too often it doesn't. But here's the thing about faith. Real faith, the kind of faith that we need to have in Christ is we can say we trust in God. It's not a blind leap either. It's real. It has substance to it, right? It has meat to it. It it holds a special place and our heart, and the reason that is is because God never lies and God never fails. Amen? He never lies and He never fails. We were singing a song a while ago about that very thing. God doesn't fail us. He's always there for us. So biblical faith, the kind of faith that we need to have that is the evidence of our salvation is the kind of faith that trusts God. Here's the second consistent component of faith. Biblical faith is a faith that stays consistently committed to God do you realize that as God's people we should be driven we should be driven by something that exists within our hearts we should be driven by this desire to consistently remain committed to him and him alone there's something in us that comes we're given this at salvation it's a part of who we are it's a part of our identity in Christ that says you know God is here's what it says it says Jesus is worth living for how many of you believe that this morning that Jesus is worth living for by saying that we're by declaring that we're saying that Jesus is worth trusting And Jesus is worth living for. I don't need the rest of the world if I have Jesus. I'll just follow Jesus. I don't need to follow anything else. I'll just follow Jesus. He's worth committing my life to. And real biblical faith, it's a commitment to God. All of God's people in the Scripture, they're driven by this faith to live for Christ. Listen to what James says. We talked about him a while ago, but here's what he says in in chapter 2, verse 26. He says, For just as the body is without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What he's saying here is he's saying, you know what? If you truly have the kind of faith, the saving faith that that, that is the evidence of, of salvation in Christ, you will serve God and serve others. Your works won't be dead. Your works will be glorifying to God. In fact, the Scriptures tell us whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. And so Scripture points out that that God's people, they're driven by what Christ has done for them and the, the Spirit that lives within them. We begin to see this. 
The Christian faith is a life of commitment. Jesus said in Luke, he said, he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Faith that is the motive behind all that we do. So when this man's neighbors, when they came to him and they didn't believe him and they rejected what he had to say about Jesus and the, and the religious leaders, they rejected him and everyone kicked him out of their community. Here's what I want you to take away with. We're almost done. In fact, I'm out of time, but I'm not done. Um, here's what we see. When everyone else rejected him, Jesus came looking. Jesus came looking. Jesus said to them, if him, he says, if, if you're looking for more to this life than what this world has to offer, I'm the guy. I'm the guy. That's what Jesus says to him. And so this morning as we look at this and we, we look at the man's response, Lord, I believe that to be true. You say you're worth more than this life has to offer, I believe that. You say you're the answer. You say you're the guy that that we've all been looking for. You're the Messiah. You're the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You, you declare that. This is what he says. I'll believe you and I'll worship you. Lord and Savior of my life. And so this morning we look at this. And we have to wonder, as we look at the man's response, what questions come to our mind here's one question here's one question that should come to your mind what do you believe about Jesus I said last week it doesn't matter what I believe it doesn't matter what Ryan believes it doesn't matter what your friends and your your neighbors sitting around you believe what really matters is what you believe and as we've looked at a story here this morning where a blind man, a blind since birth, was physically healed, but also given spiritual sight that he could see Jesus for who he is, and he declares to Jesus, I believe and I worship you. It doesn't even matter what he believed. What matters today more than anything else in the world is what you believe about Jesus. So what do you believe? And the reason I ask this is because I, I truly believe it to be the most, the most important question that we could ever consider. I've lived long enough, quite an old man, not really. I, f I feel like I'm 28 inside. I don't know why. Man, I feel young inside. I'm younger than Ryan. That's what I think. I've lived long enough to know this, though, that there was a time in my life when I didn't have Jesus. And somewhere along the line, because of what God was doing in my heart, I asked this question, what do I believe about Jesus? And from that moment on, from point A, my life has been radically transformed by the power and the presence of God. The Holy Spirit, here's what the Bible says, the Holy Spirit lives here. And just in case you didn't know, I know this is a whole other sermon for another day. This isn't the temple right here, this building. This, this is steel and, and, and sheetrock and carpet and fabric and those kind of things. Here's where the Holy Spirit lives, right? In your heart. That's right, Jojo, in your heart. What do you believe about Jesus? It matters. Don't walk out of here with questions about that and not have those questions answered. Our pastors are down here. We're here to help you understand that. You know what I love is, is the baptisms we see week after week, those people have sat down with the pastor and said, I, I want to know more about Jesus. I, I need to understand more about what's, what's going on in my life. I feel something in here, but I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. 
What do you believe about Jesus? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, listen to these words, four words, you will be saved. Look at verse 10. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. One last question, and then I'm done. I know I've gone over. Sorry. No, I'm not. I don't even know why I said that. Here, here, here's the last question. Here, here's the last question. Please, please hear this. So what do you believe about Jesus? And I, I realize there's a lot of us here today that are believers and followers of Christ Jesus. So maybe this is a better question for us. What does your faith in Christ reveal about your commitment to God? You say you believe in Jesus. You say you have faith, right? So what is that faith? reveal about your commitment to Jesus now here's why I ask that question there have been times in my life where my faith revealed I was committed to Jesus you know I mean I was living for him there have been other times in my life where my faith didn't show any evidence of salvation and I had to repent of that and turn back to him you know I understand that in our walk with Christ you know there, there's there, there's spiritual ups and downs there's we like to call them dryness, dry times in our life because that makes us feel a little better about what's going on. A lot of times it's sin, you know. Right. But one of the most challenging questions I asked myself as I wrestled with this text is how does my faith reveal my commitment to Jesus? That's another question we might ponder. So this morning, I'm going to pray. Our band's going to come up here. They're going to lead us in worship. And, and you respond. However God's calling you to respond, respond. Just turn to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Pray to Jesus. Come to this altar. Come to our pastors. Do whatever you have to do. Don't ignore him. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't reject him you're here today it's probably because he's doing something in your life he's taking that first step let's pray